another exhibition at uh, uh, the Sierra Gallery. My name is John Baker. I'm the chairman of the art department. And for our visitors, visitors over here, we know everybody, so you know who's. Um, uh, we're really, really glad to have you here. Um, I have a couple of announcements uh, for uh, juniors and seniors. Uh, on Tuesday night at 5.30, I'm going to put up a sign. If you're thinking about an internship, uh, you need to come. Uh, we'll do a, a meeting right here at 5.30 on Tuesday night uh, so that you know what you need to do uh, for internships. Uh, and there's, a, there's an event following uh, Tomas's uh, uh, lecture and reception. It's called SARS, it's the Student Annual Review Show. Uh, in which every student in the art department gets 60 seconds to talk about what they're working on right now. If they go longer, we all go, eh. Um, we even have an alumnus. Did you send it some? Yeah. All right. So from the real world. <laughs> um, I was remiss last week in not introducing to you Josh Ippel. Josh, can you stand up? Josh is now our new gallery director. Give him a hand. Woo! <laughs> Josh did his undergrad at Calvin College and his uh, graduate work at the University of Illinois Champaign. Uh, has his finger on the pulse of the art world. And I think it's going to be really interesting to have Josh. And the great thing about that is it means that the rest of us here get freed up a little bit to pay more attention to you. Josh is also um, a musician. That's right. <laughs> he, he also teaches printmaking right. at, Trinity. at Trinity. He also is one of the uh, the shop techs. General, like knows knows everything guy. Right. So and multifaceted, multi talented guy. He and his partner have the next show in the gallery. Um, the collaborative known as Hideous Beast. But that happened before I took over the gallery. So there's no, yeah. no, no, no. The first thing that he did was he's on the gallery to give himself a show. <laughs> well, thanks so much for having me. I'm super excited to be a part of um, more here at Trinity. Like teaching one class last semester was great, and teaching another one this semester is wonderful. And the gallery is like yet another excuse to be around this great community of students and teachers. So thanks. Yeah, great. Also, I just want to acknowledge. Ellen Browning, who is our other full-time faculty person, teaches graphic design, photography. She's back there, so she should be acknowledged if you haven't met her. Um, my name is Dayton Castleman. Um, I'm the sculpture professor here. I also teach uh, drawing and a variety of other things that I pick up. Um, and uh, it's my privilege to introduce Tomas Moreno. Um, I met Tomas shortly after moving to Chicago to go to graduate school at our church, um, Covenant Presbyterian Church in the Bucktown neighborhood um, of Chicago. Tomas and I immediately hit it off. Our, our relationship is not only professional, but we spent many a night in the backyard um, sitting around a fiery chimney having long, long conversations, so on and so forth. So, in addition to considering him a colleague in art, um, Tomas is also a friend. Um, he's a fantastic artist, and I was delighted to put his name into the mix um, to have a show. Um, Tomas did his undergrad work at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, um, here in this fine city. Um, he went on to do his uh, MFA at uh, Elam College of Art, or Elam? Elam School of Fine Art. Elam School of Fine Art which is a part of the University of Auckland in New Zealand. I'll let him tell you more about why he decided to go to grad school in New Zealand, if there's anything <laughs> significant there. Um, Tomas then went on to uh, complete the fine woodworking program at the College of the Redwoods in Northern California, which is a very exclusive fine woodworking program. So um, he also is not a one-trick pony, but has a lot of uh, great skills um, Tomas actually, while I was doing my graduate work, was instrumental in um, helping me procure a lot of the uh, nuts and bolts and various supplies that I would 
need, so um, he's been valuable to me also in that respect. Um, Tomas has also served our country in the U.S. Army. How long were you in the Army? Four years. For four years, Tomas was in the Army. Um, and so um, you're talking about a, very, a guy with a lot of uh, experiences, um, a lot to draw from in making art. In addition to that, Tomas' wife, Renee, is here, who is a professional illustrator. Um, she illustrates children's books, um, does a fantastic job, my wife and I. I actually own at least one of those books. And so I know that some of you may be interested in that vein of um, art, and so I imagine that she would be, uh, you could ask Tomas who she is, and she'd probably be willing to answer your questions about that particular thing, um, because that's what she does uh, for a living. So we're glad to have you, Tomas. Welcome, and uh, thanks for the good show. Okay. Um, do I do I have to stand behind this thing, or can I move? You, do. you don't. I think to speak into the mic, you do. Okay. If you want to boom it, uh, you can come out. And look do you want to grab the mic? You can do that as well. I'm sure. I don't think I can do all three at once. And <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, so I'll just get started. So um, obviously, this is me when I was a little boy, and the reason I show you this is because I want to tell you a story to begin with. Um, as you can see, I had a pretty interesting wardrobe. Uh, my, <laughs> my parents emigrated from Mexico uh, when I was about one. And um, can you hear me OK without this thing? OK, because I, I think I need to move around a little bit. Um, they emigrated to, from Mexico when I was about one, and uh, we settled in northern Indiana. Um, we used to travel a lot to Mexico. Uh, I remember this one particular time, and this is the story I want to tell you. Uh, we got very excited because we were going to visit our family in Mexico uh, for Christmas. And my mother was very excited and she decided to bring two really big turkeys. You know, it's cold. Uh, they're nice and frozen, right? We strapped them to the top of the station wagon. Uh, my father was very proud of himself because he wasn't very good at tying knots, but he managed to get these things like strapped to the top of the station wagon. And so we, uh, we took off uh, to celebrate Christmas in Mexico. Um, about, about the time we hit it, South Texas, I noticed there was this trickle of fluid actually coming down the window. The turkeys had started thawing out. Um, we pulled the, the station wagon over and my father jumped out and threw an immediate fit. He started screaming and yelling about the turkeys and uh, he wanted to throw them away. And my mother begged him not to throw these turkeys away. Um, so she prevailed. We put the turkeys, or we made sure the turkeys were secure, and so we, uh, we took off. Um, none of us actually planned to eat these turkeys, but uh, as my father tells it, when he ends the story, the turkeys were delicious. <laughs> okay, not the laughter I expected, but I'll take it. Uh, I thought it was a funny story. <laughs> anyway, so um, yeah, I, uh, I'm. So I grew up in northern Indiana, and this is uh, this was my wardrobe. Um, so uh, at one point, I decided to go to art school, and um, being so close to uh, the city of Chicago, um, I really learned to love Chicago, and uh, w ended up going to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, and began to really be influenced by you know more where I was at than by some of the things that I was seeing. This is actually uh, by a, an architect that I love, Tadao Ando, and as far as I know, it's like one of the only things he's ever built outside of J Japan. Um, it's a really beautiful, dark, contemplative space that I spent a lot of time in in undergrad. This is, one, this is a church, actually, he built in Japan. And the reason I'm showing you other people's work and other things is because, for me, where I, where I ended up is actually a journey. It's a process. and. Um, and sometimes I really care a lot more about the things that I've seen and the things that I've experienced than the things that I make. Another really big influence on me when I was studying at the Art Institute was Martin Perrier. And uh, Martin Perrier is actually a very interesting uh, person to me for another reason, too. When he was a printmaker, he actually spent some time in Sweden and he wanted to start playing with you know, wood and make sculptures. You know? And I, 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 get, I get the impression that he just wanted to play around. So he sought out the best woodworker he could find. 
and uh, it it turned out to be um, one of it turned out to be uh, James Krenoff, who I ended up going to study with later on, but I actually didn't know it until much later. Um, so this person that we have in common really actually was very formative for, um, for I think, both of us. So furniture and design. Um, after I finished my BFA, I really thought, I'm going to take a break from art, and I'm going to study furniture making. So I ended up uh, researching a few programs. and. Um, well, actually, I spent I spent four weeks here. Uh, this is uh, Parnham House, and it's in Dorset, England, and it is home. It was home to the Parnham School for Professional Craftsmen. Uh, this was a summer exchange program that I really, really just loved, and I studied with this man. Uh, this is John Makepeace. He's the founder and a really, really famous woodworker. Uh, the Art Institute has one of his chairs. I think they bought it for something like, it's one chair, $35,000. And it's an amazing work of art, as far as I'm concerned. But he, he founded that school, and I got to spend some time there. So that got me very interested in furniture making. And when, um, when I decided to go ahead and study furniture making, um, I couldn't afford to go to Parnham, so I decided to look for the next best thing. And I found the College of the Redwoods Fine Woodworking Program in Northern California. And this is a shot of the coast, uh, a coast that I absolutely love. Also lots of redwoods up there, beautiful forests. It's a great place. This is James Krenoff. He was, um, he's probably one of the biggest influences on my work um, of anyone, actually. Um, at one point, he left Sweden and decided to come to the United States and ended up settling in this incredibly remote part of Northern California. Um, it, takes, it takes like three hours to get there by car over these really windy roads. Uh, it's a little town called, called Fort Bragg. I don't know if any, anyone's ever heard of it, but uh, it's a very interesting place. All right, so this was you know, some of the, the kind of thing that I was doing, actually. It's, this is a small cabinet uh, made out of solid wood. Uh, every, every detail handmade. The doors are curved, you know, curved by hand with hand planes. Hand cut dovetails. I actually had to make special little tools. Those, the drawers are about this tall and about that, that long. So I had to make special tools to actually make those drawers. Here's a desk that I made. Again, everything handmade. Uh, Jim actually gave me the veneers for the top. It was, it was a wonderful present. I even made the drawer pulls out of brass. There's a small cabinet that I made for a friend uh, after he lost his brother. Um, it's kind of a little memorial cabinet. The inside is actually lined with aromatic cedar. And that's the little pull inside. The pull's about so big. Um, I got a commission and uh, built uh, these two benches and I just wanted to experiment with shaping wood and uh, just play around with form really. And I'm going to go through these pretty quickly because it, it has a lot less bearing on, on my, my sculpture work. Here's a cabinet that I made. Uh, it's about five, you know, 510, something like that. I tried to put everything that I could as far as um, what I knew about woodworking into this thing. Yeah, the doors, um, the doors are actually uh, staves of solid wood that were glued on a curve and then shaped into uh, an arc. And then the door, the, the actual door panels are, I actually made the plywood for that out of solid wood and, and pieces of, of thin, uh, like Luan substrate. Do you have to order the glass panes, the curved Yeah, panes? I had to order these glass panes, and no curved glass is ever perfect. <clears throat> it's, not, it's not what you think it is. So I had actually had to work to the curve on that. You know, there's bent lamination in this. There's all sorts of uh, wonderful woodworking techniques. And uh, this was, the goal of this piece was really just to make something that incorporated everything that I knew. And again, the handle I made that, or the pole, I should say. So after I finished two years at the College of the Redwoods, I, um, I decided that um, I still wanted to make art, and I loved making furniture, but 
I really missed art making and decided to look for um, a place where I could study um, and I could get an MFA. And uh, so being that I was living in California, I decided to look within California because I really at the time didn't want to leave and settled on San Diego State University. Uh, this is actually one thing I didn't tell Dayton when he uh, introduced me, but I spent about a year and a half at San Diego State at a program that was an applied design program that combined art and furniture. And uh, really, it, it, it's run by a very well-known furniture maker artist named Wendy Marayama. She's collected by places like the Renwick and other very famous craft institutions uh, throughout the country. Uh, as well as private collectors. So I thought, well, this, is, this sounds like a really good merging of the two things that I knew. Um, as you can see, San Diego State is a very beautiful campus. Uh, it's also enormous, and um, you can get lost on it very easily. And uh, it's, uh, it's in San Diego. Mm. Well, I thought it would be a really beautiful experience to be in San Diego and just stay there and make art furniture. And uh, what I began to learn about San Diego was that, this is kind of funny, right? I mean, it's a very interesting sign, but what I started to really learn about San Diego and about um, really just the region was the complexity of the region. Uh, it's a border town, it's a military town, it's a college town. Um, right across the border, uh, there's Tijuana. So you, you have, and as well as um, a lot, of, a really strange mix of uh, native San Diegans, lots of transplants, uh, even white supremacist groups that, that moved to the area because they had a problem and an issue with uh, people crossing the border illegally. Lots of illegal immigration. And I'm showing you the sign because um, it's really a symbol of kind of the strange culture of San Diego. Um, this is actually the only pedestrian accident zone in the world. So this sign is warning you like it might warn you about a deer crossing that you could hit an illegal immigrant family in this area, okay? That's one of the oddities that I found there. So I began to, you know, it, it, it's kind of funny actually, but it, it's, um, it's also really strange as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so it was at this time that I actually started considering um, what types of ideas and what types of information I wanted to put into art and how I wanted to start my art practice, being that I started an MFA program and so I began to make furniture again and begin, I began to look for influences that I could pull into it. Uh, this was a, a love seat that I made out of, uh, uh, essentially it's an upholstered piece. I built the upholstery frame and I had it upholstered and I hand forged the, uh, the legs and polished them and had them nickel plated. That was really fun. I did, I did that on a gas forge and it took me several days. It was, it was a lot of fun. But unfortunately, I'm, I wasn't exactly happy with the result. I envisioned something more dynamic, more in keeping with the program where I, where I was uh, studying. This is an example of, um, well actually, this was uh, for a show called The Beauty Project that all, uh, all of us in the uh, graduate program were, um, were a part of. And uh, we were essentially supposed to take the idea of beauty and uh, come up with a, you know, with some sort of, um, some sort of work. And being that I had spent already five years uh, near the ocean and being able to visit the ocean practically on a daily basis, I decided to um, just kind of look at the ocean for, for inspiration. And uh, I really love the idea of bioluminescence and bioluminescent form, uh, forms that live deep underwater that, you know, they make their own light in very dark places. So I decided to use that as kind of a starting point, and I came up with this series of lamps. The tallest one's about, about so big. These are just wire shapes. Uh, the wires are actually welded to a ring and then bent into a shape. And then the fabric is a, uh, like trico fabric. It's really stretchy. Uh, I sewed it into like a big cone and then put it over the shape and stretched it and tied it here and there and then covered it with fiberglass resin. And it, it was pretty effective. They seemed kind of ghostly when they're on, you know, especially when the, when the light's low. They look like little ghosts or something. It's pretty funny. So being in San Diego and being exposed to all of these very unusual um, circumstances in terms of the culture of the area, 
um, I began to sort of explore um, my my own personal identity. It, 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 I, I had some real issues with um, having grown up in a Mexican family in the United States and uh, decided to explore them through art. Uh, this is actually a self-portrait and it's a small foot, one foot by one foot square cabinet that, uh, that I built um, and I actually put paintings on. I have this love-hate relationship with painting and uh, decided to, you know, at one point start trying to incorporate painting into my work again. Um, the front is actually uh, the city of Tenochtitlan, which is the Aztec city that was in, in the place where Mexico City is today. And uh, it was built out in the middle of a lake and it had, was connected to the land by causeways. Um, as you open the first door, you see more of a, a modern day view of Mexico City and uh, kind of the pollution and the, uh, you know, the grime of the city makes it look very gray. Uh, when you open this door, you expose essentially an accordion door, which then folds out to expose the inside. Uh, and again, just monuments from Mexico City. The, uh, the far monument is actually um, like a, a colonial monument, and then the, the, the inner one is actually a, 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 uh, it was a stone carving by the Aztecs. And the whole idea, or the, the idea that this one city is layered on top of another city is really fascinating to me. Um, and then on the inside, there's kind of a little self-portrait painted on the very back, and these two little doors that open it. Okay. While in San Diego, I began also uh, experiment with stereotypes and uh, how a stereotypes might affect the way we view, uh, we view others. And so I, I came up with these. Uh, the, this is a series of cabinets that I created uh, using hubcaps as the doors. Uh, the first one is dedicated to a man named Cesar Chavez. He was a, a, a union organizer that helped farm workers you know, in California get more rights, basically. And uh, these are not that big. Uh, they're 24 inches deep, but they're you know 16 inches diameter, more or less. And they have a switch inside, so that when you open it, a small light um, illuminates the inside. And again, incorporating painting. So instead of taking a photograph of, of Cesar Chavez, I um, I did a painting of him. In this, uh, it's a monochromatic painting, and um, I just wanted to depict him as a farm worker, which is um, which is really the stereotype that he came from. Um, and the reason I was interested in stereotypes is because I wanted to sort of break through the concept of a stereotype um, by presenting you with the stereotype first and then having you question why this person is sort of enshrined, so to speak, in this cabinet and have you investigate a little more. So that was, that was kind of the goal of these. And on the inside, which you can kind of see, uh, there's, I took some uh, rubber tire tread and, and decorated the inside surface. This is uh, Emiliano Zapata. He was uh, one of the heroes of the Mexican Revolution. And again, I think you're confronted by the classic Mexican stereotype of the big hat and the mustache and the gun. <laughs> um, so to me, this is, this, is a very, uh, this is a very strong stereotype image and um, really hides the man, in my opinion, that uh, helped to liberate Mexico and helped to he actually dictated the founding document of the Mexican Revolution, which later became the Constitution of Mexico. Uh, and he was illiterate. He didn't know how to read or write. And the inside is decorated with uh, pieces of uh, plastic lenses from, uh, uh, from car tail lights. This one is called uh, Machito, and it's dedicated to uh, a very famous musician uh, who was responsible for the development of the genre Afro-Cuban jazz. He, uh, he's very well known in, in jazz circles and, very, and revered. And so I kind of, you know, painted this, this image of him as kind of the Latin lover, so to speak. Um, and in the inside, the inside of this is actually decorated with like dark blue velvet on that surface. So. so at one point, um, I decided that um, the program that I was in really wasn't helping me 
develop my ideas enough. Uh, I felt a lot of pressure to build furniture. I didn't feel like um, I really knew where my research was taking me. I was interested in all these issues that um, really, you know, I couldn't really answer the questions that I wanted to, that, that I was asking where I was. So um, I researched the Elam School of Fine Arts and moved here. This is uh, Auckland, New Zealand, and uh, the mountain that you're looking at right here in the foreground is actually an, ex an extinct volcano. It's actually, it's called Mount Eden, and uh, it's also the name of the neighborhood I used to live in. I used to live in Mount Eden, and kind of in the lower left-hand corner, that's where the neighborhood starts. And um, yeah, that's the, that's the city, and uh, I very much loved living there. It was a, it was a beautiful time. So that's located in Auckland, which is the North Island. And um, New Zealand itself is just an incredibly dramatic country. Uh, we bought a car while we were there, and we drove basically all over this country, which was amazing. It took, it took about two weeks. Here's Auckland at night from Mount Eden. As you can see, it's a pretty big area. My favorite beverage at my favorite uh, cafe. And I wanted to show you this picture only because um, that's the sky tower, and it looks, they used to light it like this all the time, and it, it looks like a giant lightsaber, <laughs> which I really love. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? It's just, it's a giant lightsaber. <laughs> so this is kind of the icon of, of uh, Auckland University. It's a bell tower, and uh, just reminds me of where, I, where, I, where I've been. And again, the landscape of the South Island, actually, pretty amazing, dramatic. One of the things that I discovered while I was in New Zealand, and this really fed right into my research, was uh, New Zealand has a culture. It's, uh, it's actually a considered, and, and it is officially, a bicultural nation. Uh, the Maori have been there for several thousand years, and uh, the land was actually settled at one point um, by, um, I think it was the Dutch, and then it was the English. and. Uh, and so it, it, has this, uh, it has this sort of combined or mixed culture of Maori culture and, you know, Anglo or Eng English European culture. And uh, it, it really made for some very interesting research. Uh, I actually found that a lot of the issues of marginalization, of, of, uh, of um, being uh, treated as other, being treated as, as someone who um, perhaps is a second class citizen, um, that I found in San Diego with, with the immigrant population was very similar to the, what I saw in New Zealand. And um, it turns out that there are very common, uh, common issues. Uh, these guys are dressed up as Maori warriors. Uh, it's a warrior culture that actually, you know, used to exist pretty much to, um, well, in, in this manner, pretty much just to defend themselves and to make war on other, other tribes or whatever. But uh, these guys are dressed up in traditional Maori dress, and for some reason, uh, Sony decided to use this image uh, to sell a laptop, um, which I found interesting. But uh, these guys, and you see the face tattoos. Uh, that's, uh, you know, when a, when a Maori warrior w actually got the face tattoo, and all these tattoos that they have uh, are in some ways very sacred and, and have some spiritual significance, but the face tattoo, when you finally got that, you were a full-blown Maori warrior, and you existed primarily to fight the battles that the tribe needed you to fight. Now this is an image of a gangbanger from South Texas. And I'm just showing you this because I found it to be a really beautiful image and very curious image. And I have a question. What, what do you suppose his tattoos are about? Pretty much the same thing. Yeah. These tattoos describe his life, his experiences, and they're, to, they're there to show people that um, this is a way of life for him, that he's adopted, and in his mind, I'm sure he thinks he's a warrior. So Mario no longer actually adopt tattoos. Most of them, some of them do. Um, but uh, this is a very common sight when you go and visit like a tourist, essentially a tourist trap. Uh, this guy is performing for the tourists, and uh, this is a, basically what his culture has become. It's become a stereotype. So while there, I began to sort of um, explore this sort of interduality that I have. And uh, 
wanting to uh, figure out exactly what what is it about me that um, that I that I have a difficult time understanding. Um, what is my identity? And so this is the first match piece that I made. It's called Me Against Myself, and it's two silhouettes. So that's both of them. That's both of them are of, of me, and uh, the matches are actually arranged on a one-inch grid. And inside the figure, I drilled more holes and inserted other matches that were actually burned. So then it came time for my uh, my graduate um, my graduate show. And again, I, I created these spaces. And again, this, this goes back to Tadao Ando, um, someone whom I really love and knows how to manipulate space. When you walked into the space, you were immediately confronted by this painting. Um, using the same, same image of uh, Zapata, I actually created an image that really seemed like a piece of signage and this fixture, I call it, uh, that looks like it belongs more in like a, a uh, storefront window or something. So that's about it's about nine feet tall or so, and it's it's actually painted on uh, it's painted on galvanized steel and it's actually done on a painting machine. It's this big uh, airbrush essentially that moves on an X Y axis and is connected to a computer. So as you move through the installation, uh, you were confronted by these cap guns. And these cap gun machines uh, were constantly causing the, the cap guns that I installed to, uh, to fire, right? There were no caps in the guns, but this child's toy, was, it was kind of interesting, the, the kind of tension it added to the space by continually snapping the cap gun. It, it, it was occasionally somewhat irritating, but really, really effective when it, when it came to creating this, this feel of like, you know, maybe I'm not supposed to be here. Uh, in the back, I tucked this video piece away so that you would have to lean in and, and kind of watch it on an angle. It's called All I Know About Myself, and it's a video loop. And it's taking these stereotypes that I've been playing with, uh, these Mexican stereotypes, and interlacing them with these images of, of these children kind of using their, their hands as, as guns, little Mexican kids, right? And then being confronted by another stereotype and the next scene would actually be of the kids running away, right? So I, the, the, the kids kind of firing with their, gun, with their guns and then running away was kind of this sort of nexus that I set up. And then I interlaced all of these stereotypes so they would, you know, pretty much in sequence be, um, be doing that over and over again. Um, it was a pretty nice video. And all of these clips I actually collected from movies that I'd seen that I had just remembered that there was this stereotype that I found interesting. I think uh, this is from uh, a, a French movie called The Eighth Day. Uh, that is um, from a movie called The Mexican. I don't know if you saw it. It's about a, uh, it, it, who was it? Uh, I can't even remember. But uh, this one is from The Three Amigos. And you can see the contrast, right? This Mexican and this Mexican. Very different, right? So as you're leaving the space, you're then confronted by uh, these two very problematic ethnographic depictions. Now, ethnography is something that I, that I find very interesting uh, and I occasionally like to look into. Um, these are two images that were, that were created uh, in two totally different parts of the world by colonial powers. Uh, the first one is of uh, an Aztec uh, uh, kind of nobleman or somebody with money created around the 15th century. And uh, he's on the left. And then on the right is um, a very famous Maori chief who uh, w was credited with unifying a lot of the tribes on the North Island. Uh, both of them, and this is the part that I find problematic, uh, neither one of these guys had any input as to what they might look like after being depicted by the ethnographer. Uh, what you're looking at is the perspective of the colonial power. You're not looking at uh, how these people might be perceived. And I also find it interesting that uh, if you look at these images closely, a lot of them, they look very feminine. And these guys would have been, well, especially the Maori chief, would have been a pretty fierce guy. 
So there's the space with a little light in it. You can see how deep it is. And uh, here's one of the cap gun machines that I built. I have this desire to make everything that I touch extremely well made. Um, and uh, actually the matches were an attempt to use wood in a way that I'd never used it and to make something still really beautiful with something that is really just a throwaway object. These, these were welded out of steel and then powder coated and uh, I, you know, I had to fit every gun to that curve and I made all the gears and everything and you know. Okay. So, all right. Um, so I graduated from Elam School of Fine Art, and then I moved back to the Midwest, and um, entered a period of, of my life that was pretty empty, um, a pretty dry time. I didn't make art essentially for um, probably about six years or so. Um, had a family and began to. Uh, wonder if I would ever at one point make art again. Um, everything I tried, everything I tried to do really just kind of turned to dust. I really didn't um, think that it was ever going to happen. About a year ago, I said to myself, I will never make art again. I just don't have time and I can't, nothing works for me. Um, some interesting things were happening at the time. I already knew Dayton. Um, I was being encouraged to do something creative uh, by other people. I things that I really weren't hearing either. I just wasn't hearing that from other people. You know, you should really make art. I don't hear that. I'm too busy. Um, but then at some point I realized that I needed to start doing this again. And uh, it was through the influence of my friends and especially Dayton who has been very encouraging to me. Um, I began to make art again and uh, began to believe that it was possible. So, um, you know, at the same time, I realized something, you know, uh, that God was really kind of stripping all of this other stuff that I didn't really need, that, this, that really was useless uh, away. Um, I had developed a certain amount of anger towards colonial power. I, 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 uh, had, uh, I, I wrote a thesis on uh, post -colonial, the post-colonial condition um, entitled uh, The Art of Camouflage, you know, Art in the Post-Colonial World. And, uh, I was, I was somewhat angry and really unhappy with, uh, with the way the world worked. Um, but then during this time, God just pretty much just stripped all that away and uh, let me start thinking about art in a new way. So the first thing that I did uh, was, was this. This is a piñata. Um, and it was for a show called uh, the Objet Petit A Show that was co-curated by Dayton Castleman. And uh, when Dayton came and asked me if I wanted to be in the show at one point, I, the first time he said, what would you think about a show like this? I was like, yeah, I, I suppose that sounds interesting. And I'm like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> I didn't really take it seriously. I thought, you know, whatever. I don't, I'm not, I don't have time for art. When he asked me again, I said, I looked at him and, and it was at this point that I realized, you know, I, I, need to, I need to do this, I need to make art. He asked me again, I said, yes I would, yes I would definitely be interested in being in the show, without, without even hesitating. And um, so I made this piñata, and it's called The Better Angels of Our Nature. Um, I'm fascinated with, uh, with Abraham Lincoln, uh, and the way he's kind of an icon now, he's, he's this, He's almost like an idol. It's really kind of strange. Uh, the better angels of our nature actually comes from a speech that he gave to attempt to prevent the Civil War. Uh, and he was asking people, you know, let's appeal to the better angels of our, na of our nature. And uh, to me, this whole piece is about, um, about democracy and about the failings of democracy. But it's not, it's not really an angry piece. It's not about, it's not about uh, having issues that I want to just be confrontational about. It's about uh, democracy as not being a perfect way of creating, you know, we, it, it can't create a perfect world, in other words. It is, it is flawed, and mainly because we're a part of it. 
Um, so I wanted to just kind of play around with that idea and also to make a really beautiful object that kind of fit the, uh, fit the show. And uh, I think subliminally I kind of made the Death Star. <laughs> you know? Doesn't it kind of look like the Death Star a little bit? It, it, I just, yeah. Yeah, I'm a Star Wars fan. So um, in <laughs> inside this thing is um, um, I put buttons. Uh, I had some buttons made with images, and I'll show you those in a second. And, uh, and pennies. I, you know, having grown up in a Mexican family, every good piñata has money in it and candy. <laughs> uh, money and candy, those are the two things you put in a piñata. I substituted for the candy, and here's a, here's a detail. The only picture they ever took, I think, of Abraham Lincoln smiling. I love that picture because it's so, it's such a rare thing. He, it was taken immediately after the end of the Civil War and he was, I think he was happy. Okay, some of these seem a little gruesome, uh, granted. Um, so these are the buttons that were inside the better angels of our, uh, the better angels of our nature, and uh, the top row is uh, is uh, they're actually images of mugshots that I found online, and uh, these are people that basically you know while they were committing some crime or did something really wrong got beat up in the process and then were taken to jail and photographed, <laughs> um, and some of them are really bad like some of the ones that I found were just hideous and uh, these were actually some of the more tame examples. The bottom row is a row of politicians that have either completely, you know, that are, that are completely uh, corrupt or have some questionable backgrounds. Um, obviously, Rod Blagojevich, George Ryan, Dan Rostenkowski, which uh, if you're, you know, if you're old enough, you know. I remember Dan. Uh, the current Mayor Daley and the former Mayor, Mayor Daley. All of them for specific reasons. Uh, you know, Rod Blagojevich, one of the most crooked politicians ever to come out of the state of Illinois. Dan, um, uh, George Ryan for, for some of the things. I mean, he seems like such a nice, kind man, but he did some really terrible things. And then um, Dan Rosinkowski, he committed a felony while in, while in, um, uh, while, while in office. Um, the current Mayor Daley, because he was, he was a, uh, he was an attorney while, you know, uh, police officers in the city of Chicago were torturing uh, murder suspects. State's attorney. State's attorney, that's it. Um, and then the old Mayor Daley, who basically wanted all of the um, black people in the city of Chicago to move to one specific neighborhood to, um, um, that to this day is, is just an absolute mess in a shooting gallery. It's uh, the worst neighborhood in the city. And that's where he wanted them all to live. That was his goal. So why did I put these in here? Okay, they're the substitute for the candy, number one. But they're also, um, it, the, the whole concept of the show was to make something beautiful, but then to have to destroy it to find out what's inside, right? Um, and uh, Dayton can tell you more about the, the actual, yeah, he could explain it better than I could. But these, these things were in there so that you could, um, you know, you could pick these up off the ground after this pinata was open to find out what was in it and kind of experiencing really some of the, the worst examples or the worst things to come out of democracy, which is uh, broken lives, broken, you know, broken careers, um, corruption, um, you know, sin. And, uh, and to know, in, in my opinion, to know that, you know, no system of government is perfect. The only perfect system uh, or the only, the only true unifying thing is God's, uh, God's grace. Um, and so, so those, and, and another thing too, this is kind of a, really not a, it's not a, uh, it was not intended to be uh, confrontational at all. But you could take these, if you, if you collected all of these and looked at them all at once, you would get what this piece is about. But for the most part, when this thing burst open, all of these buttons just flew. <laughs> And they landed everywhere. But the neat thing about it was that as soon as people saw they were buttons, they began to pick them up like they were kids picking up candy. And that, that part I just loved, and that was actually my goal as well. So the current work that I'm doing now and the work that I've done in the gallery. Um, this is White Island in New Zealand. Uh, it's an active volcano. You can actually visit, visit this island. 
I'm just fascinated by volcanoes and islands and, and, and um, land masses that are actually growing. This thing grows every year and uh, it came right up out of the ocean. And, and to me, it's, it's, it's about creation and about being inspired by God's creation. The islands that you'll see in the exhibition are really about, uh, especially the napkin drawings, are about contemplating that creation and about spending time really just um, thinking about God's creative power. And um, the, the piece on the wall, uh, the napkin piece, is actually entitled Further Up and Further In. Uh, it's actually text taken from a C.S. Lewis book, and you can figure out which one that is. It's one of my favorite books, and uh, I, um, I'm fascinated with this description of, of heaven that C.S. Lewis put together. And uh, I really wanted to create a work of art that would maybe help people contemplate the concept of heaven as a real physical place. And uh, so that's, that's why I, I tend to focus on these forms. That's another view of White Island. That, that's actually sulfur le leaching out of the, island, out of the uh, sulfur pit in the volcano. Do they have a permit for that? A permit? <laughs> I don't know. But there's the sulfur pit. You can see it. It's amazing. It's just fascinating to me. This stuff, all this stuff welling up out of the ground. Here's an atoll. And I think atolls are incredibly beautiful yeah. as a form. This was probably a little volcano that collapsed and just became, just started to wear away. You know, there's almost nothing there. It's amazing. This is a satellite an image of another island. This island's called Big Ben Island, and it's in uh, the subarctic region of Australia, at the very bottom of Australia. And uh, this island has doubled in size in 10 years due to volcanic activity. It's really amazing. Does anybody know what this is? That's Hawaii from a satellite. It's a completely different perspective, isn't it? Yeah. So anyway, those are some of my influences. This is actually a work by, by a friend of mine. Um, it's called Beautiful Afterlife. I just thought I'd show you some of the people that I, well, one person that I went to school with, uh, Mlan Bazumik, he's really an amazing guy, has a great art career right now. Um, he, put, uh, he put this image, and this is my last slide, uh, in this window and painted the entire window black and just put this one image, this circular image at the bottom and lit it from behind. It was very powerful. Um, but uh, it's kind of a beautiful place. This is uh, a wastewater retainment pond in New Zealand. <laughs> kind of gives you a, a very, a, it, it gives the term beautiful afterlife a very strange, you know, twist. But anyway, um, okay, well I just want to say thank you for uh, coming to this and uh, listening to me talk about my work. Um, I also want to thank the art department. I want to thank uh, Dayton Castleman especially for um, encouraging me to make art again and uh, helping me get a show here. I want to thank John Baker, um, and I know I'm going to forget so many. Uh, I don't even know Verily's last name. Blim. Blim, okay. Yeah. And um, Josh, I want to thank Josh. I want to thank the people who helped me. Uh, uh, Melissa, Abby, Emily, you guys were amazing. You worked so hard. Um, Abby and Emily and John as well. The, John especially uh, was here. I, I'd like to thank you too because you, you three were here till 3.30 the other night, or the other morning, uh, helping me hang that curtain. And uh, that was really, that was huge. So thank you very much for that. As well as um, um, Marcy and Ben, is it Ben? Brian. Brian, sorry, and Brian and who else? Monica, who helped me sweep, you know? Um, and Rick for helping me get that video together. Thank you so much. And uh, I think that's it. Who else? And if I've forgotten your name or forgotten to thank you, thank you. So thanks for coming, and, uh, and that's it. Thank you. Thanks.